Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, December 15th. From the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly, we are in Lesson 3 of Unit 1 for the Winter Quarter. The unit is entitled, David Honors God. David Honors God. Our lesson title from the Adult Quarterly is Negotiating Obedience. Our devotional reading was taken from Psalm 138. Our background scripture, 1 Chronicles chapter 17, verses 1 to 15, and 21, chapter 21, verses 18 to 30. And our printed passage or lesson text is 1 Chronicles chapter 17, verse 1, and then verse 3 and 4, and then verses 11 to 14. And then chapter 21, verse 18, and then 21 to 27. We essentially have two lessons today. Uh, one dealing with uh, David's desire to build a house uh, for to place the Ark of the Covenant in. And then the second is concerning uh, David's sin and the, uh, his repentance, his sin, in numbering the the people, his armies, and his repentance and restoration. Uh, the first passage uh, from First Chronicles chapter 17 deals with uh, the first, I'll call it the first lesson, and then the second taken from uh, First Chronicles chapter 21 deals with the second. Our lesson aims from the quarterly or number one, Contrast the house of David, the house David wanted to build for God with the house God promised to build David. Number two, reflect on how God's plans are greater and more satisfying than the plans we make for ourselves. And number three, seek God's wisdom in planning for the future. The lesson after the introduction has three major divisions. The first is David's plan heard and halted. That's first Chronicles cover between first Chronicles chapter 17 verse 1 and then 3 and 4. The second division is God's plan revealed. That's covered between first Chronicles 17 11 and 14. And then the third is our plan opened, and that's covered between First Chronicles chapter 21, verse 18, and then 21 to 27. From the standard commentary, the lesson title is David's House. David's House, and very quickly additional aims are summarize David's intention, God's response, and David's reaction regarding construction of a house or temple for God. Number two, explain why David refused to offer sacrifices that cost him nothing. And then number three, prepare a testimony of a time when he or she, that's me or you, expected to serve God in a certain way, but found the plans redirected by him. So we've got a couple of good lessons today, uh, and we're going to read the first, uh, the, the verses uh, connected with the first lesson, uh, and, and this is my choice of words, not, uh, not the commentators, and then have some commentary, and then we'll move forward with the second. So from First Chronicles chapter 1, verse 17, beginning at verse 1, and then 3 and 4. Now it came to pass, as David sat in his house, that David said to Nathan the prophet, Lo, I dwell in a house of cedars, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord remaineth under curtains. Verse 3, And it came to pass the same night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell David my servant, Thus saith the Lord, Thou shall not build me a house to dwell in. And then we skip down to verse 11. And it shall come to pass, when thy days be expired, 
that thou must go to be with thy fathers, that I will raise up thy seed after thee, which shall be of thy sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son, and I will not take my mercy away from him, as I took it from him that was before thee. But I will settle him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forevermore. Now, to give a little background on uh, our lesson today, the first lesson, uh, if you will recall from last week, uh, we studied how David uh, had a psalm prepared uh, and given to Asap to basically uh, have song or a read song before the congregation of uh, of Israelites that were celebrating the return of the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, uh, and that we covered that lesson before last, uh, and. And it was a beautiful psalm and basically uh, spoke of uh, everything that God had done for his people. And, and David, in this psalm, exhorted the people to praise God and to praise, praise uh, him with all sincerity. And so we don't know how much time has passed since that celebration. That celebration followed, the, again, the placement of the ark in the tent that God had prepared, uh, that David rather had prepared for it. Uh, and uh, they'd made sacrifice, uh, they'd sacrificed sev seven rams and seven bullocks, and uh, we don't know how much time has passed, but David is now reflecting on the ark, and it being uh, basically in a tabernacle or tent, while he dwells in a house of cedar, a well-built house, um, and he, he is wondering... Um, well, he's having some problems with that disparity. So we're going to get right into our lesson text here and uh, have some discussion. But first, let's just uh, just, just uh, give a word of uh, prayer here. Father, we do thank and praise you for another opportunity to study your precious word, Lord. And we pray, as always, that you would give us a clear understanding of your word, even these historical narratives, Lord. We know that all... Your word is not written to us, but it is for us and for our example, Lord. So help us to to understand, Lord, um, uh, what more clearly, Lord, how you establish David and what the everlasting throne uh, means, Lord, and means to us. And then, Lord, let us understand how uh, to be more obedient to you uh, and in all that we do, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, that as we uh, study this lesson, uh, our faith would be increased, and as our faith is increased, that our obedience to you would be increased. In Jesus' name, amen. So First Chronicles 17, verse 1 reads, Now it came to pass that David sat in his house, that David said to Nathan the prophet, Lo, I dwell in a house of cedars, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord remaineth under curtains. Uh, David, again, we don't know how long it's been uh, since the ark um, was brought back to Jerusalem, but David has had time to reflect on what appears to be a, a real travesty or real disparity here, and that is he's comfortable in a permanent structure uh, while the ark is in a temporary or portable uh, structure or a tent, basically, however elaborate it might have been. And, and David, no doubt, is, is remembering how <clears throat> Moses, how God instructed Moses to have the tabernacle constructed in the wilderness. And, of course, it made sense for the Ark of the Covenant to be in a, a tent when they were wandering in the wilderness. But now that they're settled in Jerusalem and, in fact, in, throughout uh, Israel, or the land of Canaan, um, he probably reasons that there's no more need for a tabernacle. <clears throat> Why not have a permanent, erect a permanent home for the Ark of the Covenant? And, uh, you know, we can, we can understand that. And, and obviously, uh, we'll see uh, Nathan uh, 
uh, makes an assumption here that I think maybe most of us would make in the next verse, which, by the way, is not in our lesson text. And that's verse 2. I'm going to read it anyway. Uh, then Nathan said unto David, Do all that is in thine heart, for God is with thee. And that was presumptuous of Nathan. Uh, he, neither he or David had consulted God about the matter. And in our next verse, verse 3, God is going to remind Nathan of that. So verse 3a says, And it came to pass the same night that the word of God came to Nathan. Now again, uh, they did not consult God about this, and God didn't waste any time in letting Nathan know. And of course, he's going to let David know through Nathan uh, that he has some other thoughts about that, about the matter. Verse uh, 3b and 4 read, saying, Go and tell David my servant, thus said the Lord, Thou shalt not build me a house to dwell in. So God makes that very clear, even though David is well-intentioned, and we certainly understand uh, him wanting to honor God in that way or honor um the representation of his presence that way uh god makes it clear that david is not going to build him a house now he's going to kind of flip the script here and use uh a uh, a term use the term house in a different way in the in the next few verses uh and the next uh few verses uh, between 4 and 11 are not in our lesson text, but in those verses, uh, God uh, basically uh, reminds David that he's dwelt in a tent since the days he brought uh, Israel up out of Egypt, and at no time had he commanded uh, anyone to build him a house, uh, and uh, he reminds David that he brought him uh, from tending sheep from the sheep coat and following after the sheep and made him ruler over all of Israel and and then he he basically had cut off all his enemies around him and really established his kingdom he had established him as king undisputed king and uh, so I'm going to just back up to from our where our lesson text picks up to uh, to verse 10 and it says and since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel moreover I will subdue all thine enemies furthermore I tell thee that the Lord will build thee a house now he is not referring to a, a physical house as we'll see in the next few verses he's talking about a, a dynasty he's talking about uh, a a throne uh, that his descendants will sit on, uh, and, uh, and and we know how that term is used in our our current uh, vernacular. But let's pick up at verse 11, and it says, "And it came, I'm sorry, and it shall come to pass when thy days be expired, and thou must go to be with thy fathers, that I will raise up thy seed after thee, which shall be of thy sons." And I will establish his kingdom. He's going to raise up his descendant, his seed being his descendant. And that descendant is not going to be a grandchild or a great grandchild, but it's going to be of his sons. Uh, David is not told, and at least not at this time, which son it's going to be. But God says he is going to establish his kingdom and that that means he is going to basically give that kingdom some longevity he's going to uh, to make it uh, firm if you will but it's not going to happen until after David has has died this uh, this reference to going to be with his fathers is a reference to his death and you know we when we think about this, we we remember how um, Abraham wandered in the wilderness for uh, his life, a good portion of his life, uh, having received the promise of God, 
that his descendants would inherit the land, all the land that God had David walk, I mean, uh, Abraham walk through. But Abraham never owned the land, never possessed the land, never saw the promise come to fruition. And we read about that in uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, also, um, you know, we know Moses uh, led the children uh, out of Egypt and through the wilderness for some 40 years. And, of course, because of his sin, was not allowed to come into the promised land. So David, while, uh, again, um, has good intentions, God has other plans. Uh, and, and, and actually, God tells David uh, at some point why he doesn't want him to build a physical house for him, a temple. If we turn over to first. Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 3, uh, here David is talking to his son Solomon, giving him instructions um, or just letting him know the preparations that he's made for the temple. And he says, but God said unto me, thou shalt not build a house for my name because thou hast been a man of war and hast shed blood. Uh, we know by contrast, Solomon was a uh, his his kingdom or his uh, uh, his reign, if you will, consisted of forty years of peace. You know they and they, which which David really made possible, or God through David made possible. Verse twelve a, he shall build me a house. He, now at this point again, David doesn't know uh, which son it is, but uh, God is telling him that his, one of his sons is going to build him a house. 12b, and I will establish his throne forever. Now, God is really emphasizing how he's going to establish David's descendants, his offspring's throne forever. And this forever means, uh, in, in most cases, it means for as long as the intended purpose uh, is but in this case um, it means uh, ultimately David's throne uh, that's going to be set on by one of his descendants is literally going to be established forever his greater son uh, Jesus Christ actually establishes his throne forever we can read about that in Isaiah chapter 11 verses 1 to 9 Matthew 22, 41 to 45, and then even Romans 1, 2 and 4, <clears throat> 2 to 4, and, uh, but in this case, in the, in a short term, in the short, shorter term, he's going to establish Solomon's kingdom, uh, who's going to immediately follow David, and he's going to build the house, and it's going to be one of the seven wonders of the world, by the way. <clears throat> Verse 13, I will be his father and he shall be my son and I will not take my mercy or my love or my compassion away from him as I took it from him that was before thee. Now, we know the parallel passage um, that Chronicles is quoting is from 1 Samuel uh, verse uh Actually, from First Samuel chapter seven, uh, and uh, we know that the the person that preceded David was uh, was Saul, and Saul uh, disobeyed God, and uh, and really <clears throat> did not regard God, uh, uh, certainly not in the way that David did, and so uh, God basically removed him from the throne did not establish his kingdom and uh and because of that uh Saul was vexed for a good part of his later life uh and some say with demons but um he would not but God would not take his mercy from David's descendant as he did Saul but and we know Solomon certainly was not without his own fault and sin and we know that that his many wives turned his heart from uh the lord in his in his latter years uh but uh 
this is looking this this uh, what God is saying here has a near term and a far term long term application. His greater son is going to establish his king his kingdom forever. He's going to ultimately fulfill this promise. If we, if we look at Luke chapter 1, verse 31 and 32, and, and of course we are uh, approaching uh, Christmas, the, uh, the, we're in the Advent season, uh, we read, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, his earthly father, David. Uh, and verse 33 says, And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. This is the ultimate fulfillment of this promise that God is making to David some uh, thousand years before uh, Jesus' incarnation. Verse uh, 14, but I will settle him in mine house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forevermore. Now again, we want to we be clear on the fact that we're not talking about uh, Solomon here. Uh, what, what God is saying, establishing his throne now forever. Uh, and uh, his throne shall be established forevermore. Again, God is really emphasizing the eternal nature of the house, uh, the kingdom, and the throne. Uh, Jesus makes it very clear in Matthew chapter 12, verse 42, that he is greater than Solomon. Uh, that verse reads, The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold a greater than Solomon is here that is speaking of himself a greater than Solomon is here and we see the ultimate fulfillment of this when Jesus reigns on the throne of heaven we have to go to Revelations chapter 7 Let's just look at verse 9, and it says, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, the Lamb, of course, being Jesus Christ, clothed in white robes with palms in their hands. So they are before the throne, which is established forever, uh, which Jesus uh that sits on and 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 reigns uh, again. That is what that is the ultimate fulfillment of what God has uh, promised to David. And this uh, really is an unconditional covenant. This form is not referred to as a covenant here. It is elsewhere. This is an unconditional covenant or promise that God makes with David, which means uh, David doesn't have to do anything to earn it it is something that God uh, gives by grace to David he establishes his throne and again um, makes Jesus uh, a part of his his lineage and now we turn to our second lesson or so I'm going to call it uh, <clears throat> and we're going to jump over to First Chronicles 21 verse 18 and uh, just to give a little a little background on this second lesson if you will uh, you know after David uh, has had several military victories we read about that in first Chronicles um, 18 to 20 chapters 18 to 20 uh, he commands Joab uh, the king's chief commander or general to conduct a census. Um, we see that in chapter 21, verses 1 to 17. And taking a census or numbering his, his army primarily uh, reflected uh, 
his pride, his pride in his military that he'd built. And he, uh, uh, which of course would tend to lead to a dependence on his own might and not on God and demonstrate a, or reveal a lack of faith in the Lord's protection. And Joab at first objected, or he did object to the order, but the king was insistent and, uh, and actually, we, we're, we're told that Satan actually inspired or God allowed Satan to inspire David to number the people. And so anyway, Joab was commanded he, and he and his, uh, uh, he took uh, members of the army and they did the census from Bear, from Dan to Beersheba, from the, the, from the highest, uh, point to the lowest point in uh in Israel and they numbered uh some hundred and uh, well, I'm sorry uh, one million three hundred thousand eight hundred thousand uh other tribes Israel Israelite tribes and five hundred thousand uh, from Judah and the Lord asked him um you know the Lord was immediately displeased with what David had done and gave David three choices of punishment, or judgments, if you will. Uh, one was to uh, to be given to over to the uh, one was to be given over the hands of his his enemies. Uh, one was uh, to suffer a plague for three years, uh, and then one was I think the enemies for three months, and then. One was a three-day plague, a plague for three days, and De- and and, De- and David, of course, opted to choose uh, the mercy of the Lord, to depend on the mercy of the Lord, and accepted the three-day plague. During that plague, uh, some seventy thousand uh, men perished, and uh, I would say men, women, and children. The number was probably much higher. We see that in First uh, Chronicles twenty-one fourteen. So we pick up at. Uh, at a point where, and, and we're going to back up a little bit here uh, to put uh, where our lesson picks up in context. So, so I'm going to back up to verse 14. This is, uh, again, First Chronicles 21, 14. So the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel, and there fell of Israel 70,000 men. And God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying, the Lord beheld, and he repented him of the evil, and said to the angel that destroyed, It is enough, stay thine hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Onan, or Ornan, the Jebusite. And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord stand between the earth and the heaven, having a drawn sword in his hand, stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders of Israel, who were clothed in sackcloth, fell on their faces. And David said unto God, Is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered, even I? It is it that is it even, brother, I it is that have sinned and done evil, Indeed, but as for these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, O Lord, my God, be upon me and my father's house, but not upon thy people, that they should be plagued. So the angel with the outstretched sword symbolizes his uh, readiness to continue the destruction uh, by plague uh, of of, uh, Jerusalem and Israel. Uh, and God has stayed him for the moment, and then God picks up by giving him the angel of commandment to give to uh, to David through a prophet or seer, Gad. So we pick up at verse 18, and it says, Then the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David that David should go up and set up an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. Now it's called some. His name is called something else in the parallel passage in uh, Samuel, First uh, Samuel. But 
Uh, let's go with the Ornan. That's easy enough to pronounce. Uh, and so the angel is near the threshing floor. That's where David uh, sees him. And the threshing floor, of course, was a place where they separated uh, grain from chaff, from some type of uh, wheat grain kernels from the chaff and it was usually a, a large flat area with a hard uh, compacted dirt and uh, and that's where Ornan and his sons were uh, when David began to approach them and actually they saw it they saw at the angel first and Ornan's sons were afraid and fled now we're going to actually see, skip over the verse where that's uh, mentioned, verse 20, and it says, And Ornan turned back and saw the angel and his four sons with him hid themselves. Now Ornan was threshing wheat. Now Ornan was a Jebusite, and uh, we, uh, we know that the Jebusites were among the people that got uh, had uh, commanded the Israelites to destroy. They were one of the, the ites, the Hivites and the Jebusites and, uh, and the Canaanites and, and the Moabites and so forth. Uh, and we can uh, we can read about that in uh, Genesis chapter 15, verses 18 to 21, uh, Exodus chapter 3, verse 8 and 17, and elsewhere. Um, and we know that while um, uh, there were, for the most, they were for the most part uh, destroyed by the Canaanites, a few remain of uh, the various people that had inhabited the land. We know that uh, um, we know that the Hittites were also, uh, as I said, among that group, and Uriah. The Hittite, the the husband of Bathsheba, was a very faithful soldier in David's army. We know that David had him killed. So there were a faithful a remnant of people, no doubt, from the tribes or peoples that had been, people groups that had been destroyed, uh, that had uh, uh, perhaps been proselytized and accepted Judaism. Uh, and certainly uh, we see that. Uh, Ornan honors David as his king. So let's go on. Verse 19. Actually, we jump over to verse 21. And it says, And as David came to Ornan, Ornan looked and saw David and went out of the threshing floor and bowed himself to David with his face to the ground. So, so Ornan is affording David the respect and honor of a king. He's recognizing him again as, as his king and bowing himself. Um, and he is, again, he and his sons had been threshing. Uh, the angel appeared to them uh, or was in sight, frightened the boys, and on in his ear, uh, <clears throat> perhaps by himself, uh, bowing to the king. Verse 22a, then David said to Ornan, Grant me the place of this threshing floor, that I may build an altar therein unto the Lord. And I may have mentioned our parallel passage came from 1 Samuel. Actually, our parallel passages, passages came from 2 Samuel chapter 7 and 2 Samuel chapter 24. So David uh, uh, basically tells Ornan to grant him the place. Uh, where he is, uh, that he might build an altar. Now, God has commanded him through his seer, Gad, to build an altar. And the purpose of an altar, uh, of course, is to make a sacrifice. And the, sac the purpose of the sacrifice is to acknowledge uh, sin, some sin, and, of course, petition God's uh, forgiveness, uh, his forgiveness for the sin. So David has repented. He's he's already said he's acted foolishly, or uh, he will declare that that he's acted foolishly, and he asked God to forgive him. And we we saw earlier or read earlier how he wants God to just punish him and his father's house, and not to continue to punish the nation for his sinful act. Um, 
Part B of 22 says, Thou shalt grant it to me for the full price that the plague may be stayed from the people. Now, you know, I don't know that uh, Gad mentioned that the plague was going to be lifted if he built this altar and made a sacrifice. Maybe David is just trusting that God is going to do that. Uh, but he, he is not wanting any discounted price for the place. Uh, he's wanting the entire area, as we'll find out uh, a little later, uh, not just the immediate threshing floor. And, uh, of course, uh, we skipped over some verses where, no, nope, no, nope, we didn't. It's the next verse. Uh, so, uh, obviously, the king could have simply commanded that the land be turned over to him. Uh, we call that eminent domain these days where, <laughs> where the government just takes over your property for the good of the, for the greater good of the area or the, uh, the public. Uh, verse 23 says, And Arnon said unto David, Take it to thee, and let my lord the king do that which is good in his eyes. Lo, I give thee the oxen also for burnt offering, and the excuse me, threshing instruments for wood and wheat for the meat offerings. I give it all. So Arnon was willing to give everything that David needed to build the altar and the wood and uh, the, the, to build a fire on the altar and and the, the sacrifice of uh, both the animal, the oxen, and the food or meat offering, uh, and uh, uh, which, you know, was very generous. I mean, very generous of, again, a man that uh, was a Jebusite. Uh, of the people group that the Israelites were commanded to destroy when they came in. So it really shows uh, some extraordinary character on his part. But uh, in verse 24, David says, And the king and King David said to Arnon, Nay, but I will verily buy it for the full price, for I will not take that which is thine for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings without cost and David refuses the offer uh, he is uh, a, a, a very uh, he, he's basically uh, reminding us of a very important principle and that is uh, we are to give to the Lord uh, sacrificially or we are to give something that costs us. That's what gives it meaning uh, to the Lord, something that costs us. If we give him, and in this case, um, they were sacrificing animals and, and food offerings, but if we were to give him money that was given to us, uh, for example, we were to give that as a tithe, it would not be, it would be meaningless to God because it meant it, it cost us nothing. And it was not uh, out of our, what he had provided for us in, the, in our normal course of life. Uh, in terms of his provision, he wants us to return a portion of what he blesses us with. So that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great principle that uh, David is reminding us of here. Verse 25 says, So David gave Ornan for the place 600 shekels of gold by weight. 600 shekels of gold by weight. Now, you serious Bible students out there uh, that read the parallel passage in 2 Samuel chapter 24 noted a pretty big discrepancy. In that passage, Ornan is called Ornan, or it's spelled differently, but I guess it's pronounced the same. Uh, and it looks like there that David pays, I said, it said, so David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. 50 shekels of silver. Well, that, that's a big difference. Uh, 50 shekels of silver, uh, that's quite a bit less than the 600 shekels of gold. So how do we explain that? 
Well, the explanation really is found in the first few verses of uh, chapter 22 of Second Chronicles. It looks like uh, David bought the entire area, not just the threshing floor. He may have paid just the 50 shekels of silver for the threshing floor and the oxen, but he bought the entire area because verse 1 of chapter 22 tells us, uh, Then David said, this is the house of the Lord God, and this is the altar of the burnt offerings for Israel. And David commanded to gather together the strangers that were in the land of Israel, and he set masons to hew wrought stone and to build the house of God. And David prepared iron in abundance for the nails, and it talks about him. Uh, cutting down uh, cedars and so forth. So he jo he purchased that whole area with the 600 shekels of gold to to actually harvest the materials needed uh, for the temple that Solomon would build. At least that that seems to be uh, uh, one interpretation. Now verse 26a and David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called upon the Lord. So David uh, does as Gad, uh, God commanded him through Gad. He built the offer, the altar rather, and he offered a burnt offering and peace offering for sin. This is to, to make peace or restore peace with God for sins that he had committed. This is a personal offering. It's not for the people. It's for him. It's an offering uh, for his sin. And then um, verse 26b says, And he answered him from heaven by fire, the altar upon the altar of burnt offering. So God demonstrated his acceptance of the offer by sending fire from heaven to consume it. Uh, we see where God did that uh, in Second Chronicles seven one, uh, when uh, when the Lord is pleased with the dedication of the temple, uh, and we see uh, that uh, at Mount Carmel when after Elijah prays at Mount Carmel, First Kings uh, chapter eighteen verses thirty six to thirty eight. Or how God sends fire to consume the offering, and that demonstrates His acceptance of the offering, and is, and is, is, is He's pleased with the offering. And then finally, verse 27, and the Lord commanded the angel, and He put up His sword again into the sheath thereof. So God had had stopped the. Uh, the plague that uh, he gave uh, David um, the choice of choosing uh, God or David rather uh, threw himself uh, in the, the hands the mercy before the mercy of the Lord rather than be turned over to enemies for for X number of months three months I believe or a, a play a, a famine for seven years uh, and God, of course, did. Uh, he didn't repent when the word repent was used. It means that God just stopped. Uh, he obviously knew uh, what, how much suffering he was going to inflict or allow. Uh, but uh, he wanted David to truly repent of his sin. And of course, David was influenced by <clears throat> by pride. Uh, that Satan actually induced him or tempted him to uh, to uh, indulge in, and and we want to be careful because um, you know the, the proverbs tell us, "Let he that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall." Or that actually, uh, Jesus said that, and we are to always be on guard, especially at those times when we are experience some victories or some high points in life, because. Uh, we become vulnerable then. Sometimes we can uh, perhaps, and I certainly hope we don't, uh, take some personal pride and think that uh, we are experiencing whatever high uh, or victory because of our own strength and not give God the glory. 
Uh, God wants us to give him the glory in everything, every good thing. Now, the foolish and, uh, and, and sinful things that we do, certainly we're to take full credit for those. We're to repent of them and we're to forsake them. But anything good that we do say or think, we need to give God praise for. So I hope that we have learned uh, a little more about these passages today uh, covered by our two, our two lessons. And may God bless you and may God keep you is our prayer.